the lecture number 57. Today we are looking at historical topic 6.12, controversies over the role of government in the Gilded Age. And today we're talking about politics and power because it's the role of government. The learning objective is explain continuities and changes in the role of the government in the U.S. economy. So some argued that laissez-faire policies and competition promoted economic growth in the long run and they opposed government intervention during economic downturns. So these laissez-faire policies are based on the work of Adam Smith back in 1776 that the market should be guided by the invisible hand and that government should not interfere. So industrialists like Andrew Carnegie benefited from the lack of regulation, the lack of minimum wages. They would argue that, that economic growth and the jobs that they created outweighed the negative effects because at this point, even the industrialist cannot ignore that there are negative effects with the current system. So inside of the Gospel of Wealth that Andrew Carnegie wrote in 1889, he includes this, the price which society pays for the law of competition, like the price it pays for cheap comforts and luxuries, is also great. But the advantages of this law are also greater still, for it is to this law that we owe our wonderful material development, which brings improved conditions in its train. So he's acknowledging that there would be negative effects in this competitive uh, system, but he says that the benefits outweigh the negatives. Now, industrialists, they preferred hard money that was backed by gold to maintain their wealth, and they influenced government to give subsidies, raise tariffs, and also not regulate. So despite this um, call for government to stay out of the uh, economy, the industrialists and the people who were wealthy, they certainly had a lot of influence on government that, and the laws that they passed. So you can see this from the Puck cartoon, The Bosses of the Senate, where all of the uh, trust bosses are overlooking the senators as they are writing legislation. Some of them are looking over their shoulder as they're nervously trying to uh, write new laws. So it's saying that now business has undue influence on government and they are uh, writing legislation that's going to continue to be beneficial to the industrialists. Now, the idea that the government was not involved in the economy during the Gilded Age is frankly wrong. There was a lot of government involvement and intervention in the economy. However, all of their intervention was benefiting the industrialists. So to begin, we have railroad land grants starting in the 1860s. They were used to leverage the construction of the railroads. The railroad companies used that uh, value and that asset to speculate on uh, the land to sell at a future date. And that often led to a bubble that would crash and lead to national economic downturns. Some of the construction companies and the construction of the railroads were mired by scandal. So if you remember the Credit Mobiliere scandal in which the U.S. government officials were being implicated on this um, siphoning of the money that was supposed to go to the construction of the railroad. It resulted in monopolies and fixed prices by some of the people who owned entire railroad lines like William Henry Vanderbilt seen in the bottom right. So he was able to set the prices that he wanted, artificially high prices, for the northeastern region of the United States. Uh, tariffs were also being passed during this time, and they were protective tariffs that would benefit the industrialists. The McKinley Tariff of 1890 is an important one. The Dingley Tariff of 1897 uh, was passed to raise tariffs once more after the McKinley Tariff um, had been moderated, moderated. They were helping industry because it kept foreign competitors out of the U.S. market and it made consumers have to pay more money for the products that they were buying. Farmers who were trying to sell their crops abroad were now bearing the brunt of this because they were subject to retaliatory tariffs. Other countries would place tariffs on U.S. goods or U.S. imports because um, the United States was putting that barrier on them. And so the result was that other countries would be less likely to buy U.S. products or U.S. exports. 
Uh, the, the silver issue, in 1873, the United States government stopped the coining of silver, uh, which kept inflation down and it strengthened their industrialist position. However, it made it a lot harder for the farmers to repay their debts as they were already struggling with the, high, with the low crop prices. Uh, as far as regulation, there was slow progress with the Sherman Antitrust Act being passed in 1890 and the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887. Um, while there was movement there a lot of the time, it did not have the um, ability to do what the law was intending. Uh, in fact, the Sherman Antitrust Act was used against labor unions from interfering in the manufacturing and the business. Um, the Supreme Court limits the regulation that the government can do in the Supreme Court case U.S. versus the E.C. Knight Company. All right, and then finally in foreign policy, foreign policymakers increasingly looked outside U.S. borders in an effort to gain greater influence and control over markets and natural resources in the Pacific Rim, Asia, and Latin America. So here's another example of how the government was involved in helping business. With Hawaii, uh, the, there were business interests and sugar plantations that had secured exclusive trading rights with the United States. But because Hawaii was foreign territory, it became subject to the 1890 McKinley Tariff. It hurt profits on the sugar exports, even though some of the uh, sugar planters in Hawaii were American companies. So in 1893, uh, American settlers and people of American descent in Hawaii um, and diplomats of the United States, with the help of uh, the U.S. Navy, overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy and Queen Liliuokalani, who was the, the head monarch at the time. Because Grover Cleveland had just been elected president and he had a strict anti-imperialist stance, he rejects the annexation of Hawaii, but that doesn't put... Queen Luliokalani back in the throne. Instead, Hawaii adopts a presidential system of government and Sanford Dole, seen in the top right, becomes Hawaii's president until it's annexed before the end of the century. All right, so that was it. Here's our recap. Industrialists claimed an economy with little government involvement was most efficient, but the reality was that they benefited greatly from government intervention in the economy. Actions in Hawaii were the most extreme example in an attempt to control resources abroad. All right, so that was it for this lecture. Please make sure to come back for lecture number 58 when we talk about politics in the Gilded Age. I'll see you then.